From the studios of KENW on the campus of Eastern New Mexico University, it's You Should Know, featuring the people and events of Eastern New Mexico and West Texas. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on You Should Know. I'm your host, Evelyn Ledbetter, and my guest today is Dr. Donald Doc Elder. Welcome. Evelyn, thanks so much for having me back. Yeah, definitely. We, we, uh, there's a lot to talk about, and we, we always seem to run out of time. So thank you for coming in. I've been a lucky guy. I've been able to be a lot of places and do a lot of fun things. <laughs> oh, cool, cool. Um, well, in one of our previous times that we were chatting, I um, talked about you had went um, you taught high school for, for nine years yes, and then decided you wanted to, to the timelines of coaching high school and didn't leave any family time. No. And I'm a very family oriented person. Right. Uh, at the end of the day, I've been fortunate enough to have won a lot of awards, but if it can be said that, uh, I was a good husband and was a good father. Those are the only two awards that really matter. Well, and I think we talked about this. You just don't get that time back. So, I don't. so you decided to go into uh, grad school and get your doctorate in history. And, uh, and there's kind so, of an interesting story that yeah. I had narrowed it down uh, to two schools because the last year that I was a basketball coach, we had gotten snowed in place on a trip home from a road trip. The road ahead was impassable because of snow drifts. We tried to turn around and go back, but the road had drifted shut behind us. And so it, it was 20 below zero. And mm. so literally, we were going to freeze to death in this bus <laughs> if it ran out of fuel. And uh. so we were looking at this fuel gauge, and it's like, oh, my gosh, my life's going to end on some <laughs> oh, deserted cool. stretch of road in Ireland. And finally, at the last second, a snow plow broke oh. through got us to the next community where we had to sleep in a gymnasium. I have done that in San Juan. So, <laughs> it's, but uh, it's not a lot of fun. No. And uh, it probably wasn't 20 below zero like it was no, in, no. in Iowa. So I told myself, I'm going to go to grad school, and I'm going to go somewhere where it's warm. And <laughs> so I narrowed it down to the University of Arizona and University of California, San Diego. Both of those schools mm. had outstanding standing graduate programs at the time, and they were both warm. And I actually was <laughs> oh, really leaning towards the University of Arizona. But at the last of the very last interview I had when I was on campus in Tucson, mm -hmm. like I said, why do you want to come here? I said, well, because great reputation and everything. I said, we're, we're starting to get known, but we don't really have the reputation. So you'd really be wasting your time. Oh, and it's like I appreciated the guy's honesty. Wow. <laughs> then, but, he wasn't their stellar recruiter, was uh, he? <laughs> no, he was. He was a really smart guy, but not Don't when it come comes here. to public Don't relations. <laughs> and uh, uh -huh. so, then University of California, San Diego was a really nice option, quite obviously, and they were nice enough to give me a fellowship, and then. Okay got a chance to be the assistant women's basketball coach when I was there. So for a whole number of reasons, life worked out really well for me. But it's interesting to speculate that I might, my life would have been totally different if I'd gotten a PhD oh. from the University of Arizona. Sure. And those leaps of faith you take. I mean, you had a young family and yep. and um, no take, giving up a paycheck and taking on debt to go to school. So yes. that's that's huge. Did you work while you were going to school? So fortunately, I was able to get some sort of a fellowship uh, every year that I was there, which helped uh, being the assistant women's okay. basketball coach helped. But once again, I'll give a lot of credit to my wife, Janine, who just got a job and plugged away and worked really hard. And we scrimped and we saved and we managed <laughs> to get through. And then as the expression goes, I tried to pay her back with interest after that. But <laughs> you, I, I could not have uh, done it by well, myself. A lot of things are teamwork yep. on and off the court. Yep, so, exactly. So finished up your schooling and then what did you decide then? Well, when I knew I was going to get my PhD, then back at the time, there used to be two big conferences that were held in the world of history. There was the American Historical Association okay. and the Organization of American Historians. And the way it used to work was that 
they would advertise uh, universities that needed a new faculty member. They'd advertise that they were going to do interviews at one of the conventions. And so you'd write mm. to that school and you'd try to make the short list and sure. get an interview. And so I had done interviews um, at the Organization of American Historians. I'd done interviews at the American Historical Association. And I hadn't gotten any job that I applied for. So I honestly didn't really know what I was going to do because I was going to get my PhD and they were going to kick me out of what at the time was called married student housing, you know, <laughs> not so campus housing. Right. Um, and I literally didn't know what I was going to do. And I was starting to think I might have to go apply to like high schools in San Diego and teach like at Morse or, you know, Wilson High School or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, but then out of the blue, a small liberal arts college called the University of Redlands, which is right next to San Bernardino and Riverside, uh, part of what's called the Inland Empire in California. Out of the blue, uh, the chair of the department called and said, well, we've got a professor who's going to be on sabbatical. And so we need a person to come in for a year. And uh, would you be interested in, in applying for that job? I said, heck yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I drove up to Redlands, which is about an hour and a half from San Diego, okay. and did the interview. And I guess they liked what they saw because they offered me the one-year position. Very nice. And uh, then towards the end of that first year, they said, well, we really – really like you and we'd like to keep you so we're going to add a tenure track position oh. and so then i was able to become Great. a tenure track and work towards becoming an associate professor and getting tenured and i i loved right this is going to be like a public relations <laughs> for redlands california there, there because i i loved redlands the university was great how um, big of a school what was enrollment it would the enrollment uh, was only like twelve hundred. Okay, so really so, small. Yeah, so they limited incoming classes to mm -hmm. three hundred. Uh, but Redlands is nestled right in the mountain that leads up to Big Bear. So if anybody in our audience knows the oh, resort of nice. Big Bear, California, sure. that's the you go right uh. through Redlands on your way up to Big Bear. <clears throat> Forty-five minutes from Dodger Stadium, and as oh. we have established already. Oh. Huge Dodgers fan, so this was tremendous. But, but you never made it through the doors, right? <laughs> More often, I would have been way farther ahead in my career if I had not uh, skipped out and gotten to Dodgers oh, Stadium. No, uh, that's, forty-five that's... minutes from Huntington Beach. I'm a I'm a huge beach person. Very I nice. Love the beach, and so for me, it was it was a great place. I had great, highly motivated students to work with, and beautiful scenery, but. Your kids Redlands. had to have loved this. Well, what a great place to grow up and baseball games and the beach. And But the problem was it's on the Interstate 10 corridor leading out of L.A. And that's where the smog goes. Oh. So the smog develops in L.A. and then just gradually drifts westward. Right. And so by mid-afternoon, a blue sky morning is now gray like leaden gray mm -hmm. to the point Evelyn I never saw a sunset because the smog was so thick that the sun just became this orange wafer that kind of went down to the and, and literally it just disappeared so it was still almost light. like like what we have here when we have wildfires it's exactly Is it that, that same orangey brown exactly, glow exactly yes and you just your eyes burn and yep. you can't breathe and and that's every day that's every day in Redlands, California. Well, I was going to ask what in the world talked you out of there if it was that great place. But the the this... pollution was bad, and I'm, I figured that my lungs were pretty well developed by that stage. But I had two young sons, right. and it's like I don't want them having lungs that are going to have limited capacity because of this. The schools were overcrowded because Redlands had been a town of about 15,000 in 1960. By 1980, their population was 60,000. By 1990, the population grown to 75,000. So you've got a town built with an infrastructure for 15,000 people, and all of a sudden you've got 
five times that number of people that are on the streets trying to. And the cost of living is so expensive. Can I ask what was your starting wages? Do you remember? I can tell you for a fact that I signed my contract. Well, the, the first year was a visiting contract, but my first contract uh, that I signed uh, back in 1990, I made the princely sum of uh, $32,000. But that's quite a bump from, didn't you say your first was 9,700? Uh, yes. I think I did the math, $3.40 yes. an hour. Yes. On a normal so, work week. <laughs> so yeah, you're rocking I, it. I had it made. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when it, uh, it became obvious that housing was just out of Unreachable. the question. I mean, there was no way I was going to be able to sure. afford a house. And so we were going to have to essentially live in an apartment. It's like, oh, that's a drag because my sons, Cam yeah. and Brian, were having to be in the same bedroom. Right. And it was like, that was not optimal. Schools were overcrowded. Um, unfortunately, crime was starting to become a thing. And so I reached the point where I hadn't talked it over with my wife and said, you know, Let's, for me personally, this is a great place, but I don't think for the family. Right, professionally, is, it's wonderful. And, and she threw in one other thing because the San Andreas Fault runs like two miles from Redlands, and so anytime there was any tremor anywhere in Southern California, you got a big we hit. We called it, oh. and I actually had that experience for the first time because I was teaching a class on. Uh, modern U.S. history, and I was actually showing a documentary called The Day After Trinity, which is about the, the subject that's popular right now, the Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. And so they were showing the footage of the first test, and all of a sudden, I had my hand up against a pillar, and I was kind of leaning as I was showing this, and all of a sudden, the whole room starts to shake. <laughs> well, in the movie Oppenheimer, if you go to see it in an IMAX, well, the room does shake. Right, you but I thought, feel how that. realistic is this documentary? <laughs> and then it's like, no, uh, it's not the documentary that's <laughs> causing this room to shake because all the kids more... are like freaking out. It was an earthquake. Oh. And this is an old building and built way before safety codes. And sure. so chandeliers are shaking oh. and everything. And my wife is terrified of earthquakes. And so it's like, can we find some place that doesn't have earthquakes? So, so you, how do you even start looking? At that point, you don't have internet. So you just start looking in trade magazines yep. or newspapers and things like that to try to find. So how I, many schools interested you to move to? Uh, I Here again, I applied to a whole bunch. And it was like I wasn't getting any traction, which really surprised me because I had teaching experience. Right. But I didn't have a book published wow. yet. Um, I had a book that I had written that was in the process of being put into a, a form where it could be printed. Um, and so finally, in late April of 1995, I got a call from a woman who at the time was Linda Moore. And she was the chair of the history department at Eastern New Mexico University and mm -hmm. said, well, we liked really your application, nice. and, and Evelyn, I'll be honest with you, I completely forgot that I had applied. It's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, oh, like really intriguing. This is who? <laughs> <laughs> and, who and, really, and uh, so she said, well, we'd like to bring you to uh, Portales for an interview. Uh -huh. And uh, so first week in May, 1995, came to Portales and had an interview, and Patrice Caldwell at the time was mm -hmm. actually the dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Right. A man by the name of George Mahaffey was the vice president mm -hmm. for academic affairs, and Everett Frost was right. the president of the right. university. So I met with those individuals, okay. and uh, I guess I said the, the right thing. And, and something else that had really helped me was that uh, I had written my dissertation on the American space program and the first three years of the space program uh, from 1957 to 1960 when Eisenhower leaves office. And um, I had sent this off to companies thinking this is going to be New York Times bestseller mm -hmm. material. Of course. Kept getting rejected, of course. rejected, rejected, uh -huh. rejected. Finally, a company said, we like what you're saying about the space programs themselves, especially the communication satellite. Mm -hmm. So 
take out all of the diplomatic history stuff and just concentrate, and especially on our first telecommunication satellite. And so, because I wanted to get a book published, I, I took you, out all the diplomatic. All the history, all, all the history part. All of the stuff all that was so stuff important to me. Yeah, I, oh, no. I'm doing this wonky tech about, you know, the difference between a passive repeater and an active repeater satellite and <laughs> everything like that. And uh, uh, so company, true to their word, once I took out all the history stuff and just made it a really very technical, this was how you do it if you want to send a satellite into orbit that's going to be a telecommunication satellite. Uh, it was published in Lo and behold, it won the national, well, actually the international award as the best book written on the subject of space history. And so I, I think Eastern probably would have hired me anyway, because Linda Moore said specifically she wanted somebody that could teach Civil War, okay. somebody that could teach American military history, and somebody who could teach social studies methods. Well, those were three subjects I was teaching at the University of Rutland. And like if I had written a job description oh, for myself. How perfect is that? It, exactly. So it was, uh, I, I had exactly what they were looking for. I had teaching experience and I had a book that was an award winning book. And so. It sealed the deal. So, but I, I love my time at the University of Rutland. I uh, made a lot of good friends. I uh, had great colleagues have students that I haven't been there since 95. So oh, you haven't like went back. 28 years, but students who still sure. stay in touch with me. And so it was, for me personally, it was a great place to be, but from a family standpoint, it wasn't. And Portales, New Mexico had that kind of small town Midwestern right. charm, but with a lot nicer weather. Right. And I didn't think that I was going to get stuck in a snowstorm <laughs> and you know, have my life in we, jeopardy. We don't have major. We have weather, but nothing too traumatic. No nothing hurricanes, traumatic. no an occasional tornado, I guess, but not a lot of rainstorms <laughs> or snowstorms. But. So I, I got hired. And uh, so on August of 95, uh, moved. And uh, today, Eastern New Mexico University has a fairly generous relocation okay. policy that uh, back in the day they didn't. They gave you like a thousand bucks and so you're not going to be able to get a major moving company oh, no. to move you <laughs> from Redlands, California. So it's like, okay, we'll just move ourselves. How tough could it be? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so man. We rent, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, how tough. I won't say the company we rented for reasons that will become apparent, but uh, rented a truck and loaded up our stuff and we were driving and all of a sudden my temperature gauge just goes way into the red. And it's like, oh my gosh, I'm only going like 55 miles an hour and it's way in the red. So I slow down to the legal limit, oh. which is 45 miles an hour. And it's just barely there. hovering right there. <laughs> and we had made a reservation stay in Las Cruces the first time. Mm -hmm. So we are supposed to get there, you know, I thought about like midnight, right. we get there at five in the morning. Oh no. Got to cover our sleep, call up the company, and they sent somebody out and say, Oh, there's nothing wrong with the engine. It's the fuel gauge or the temperature gauge. And so he just adjusts and said, You're oh, good to go. Now. So you made all those miles and for, at 45 miles an hour for nothing. <laughs> but okay, we're in Las Cruces and they point me in the direction of Highway 70. You go that way. Don't get off. Don't vary. <laughs> 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 you can't miss it. <laughs> exactly. And so we're driving and we're almost to Apache Pass. And all of a sudden, boom, every gauge on the dashboard just lights up. And so I pull over to the side, and sure enough, smoke starts coming out of the engine. Oh. And this isn't just an inaccurate temperature gauge. Something <laughs> is majorly wrong. Maybe there. the gauge was right. Uh, maybe it was. <laughs> you know, who knows? Maybe the guy didn't know what he was oh. talking about. But so our moving truck broke down, and... It was days before they got somebody wow. there to fix it. So I arrive. I've got to show up for my first day of meetings. And literally, I've only got like the clothes <laughs> on my back. <laughs> I, fortunately, the, you know, I explained to the president of the university, I normally would dress up a little bit more. Right. But these are the only clothes I have. Uh, so, and and civil, civil uh, history, civil war history has always been 
your favorite. Yes. And so you got to teach that stepping into it. I was very fortunate that my very first semester I got to teach Civil War and I got to teach American military history and I got to teach social studies methods. Okay. And that, Evelyn, is really one of the, the great joys of being at Eastern because I had great teachers who helped make me the person that I've become. They didn't just teach me facts. They taught me sure. life lessons. They, they modeled a type of behavior. Right. And so for me to be able to help young people who want to follow in that path, it just gives me great joy. And I look at like Portales Junior High, the entire history department, Portales Junior High, they were my advice. <laughs> Everybody at Portales High School, one exception, they were advised these of mine. So everywhere in this area, I've got kids that well, sure. were my students. Well, you were dressed up like Abraham Lincoln and came into my son's fourth grade classroom the first time I met you. And obviously, he's one of your stellar presidents high on the list. But Spencer was a great, and we can, <laughs> I think, publicly say that uh, Spencer is your son. And just, what a nice young man. Oh, well, thank you. you. But, but he has that passion for history. Yes. And so that was a great fit between the two of you and you started doing a lot of things in with yep. the schools and teaching the dual enrollment classes and things that we have here at Eastern. And yeah, I think he stayed with you all the way through. So, And a regular winner of an award that we used to give on the radio program. That's true. And when you, well, let's talk about that a little bit. We, we, we don't have just a ton of time, but yeah, tell, tell us how, so you're teaching and then you got a chance to start in with radio. How did that come about? I'd like to tell all of the people that are watching this program that I had this vast experience in training and broadcasting. My broadcast experience had been I, when I was a football coach in Benton, Iowa. Um, I started out as a junior high football coach and junior high football coach is scout. So the, the week before you play a team, your scouts go and watch mm -hmm. that team and then bring back a scouting report. I was a horrible scout. I was <laughs> terrible. I, I could show like who got the ball and where they went, but what the defense was, the offense, I had no idea. So coach calls me in before next to last year I was there and said, Elder, you're absolutely worthless to me as a scout. I thought he was going to fire me. He said, but cable TV has come to Vinton, Iowa. Local boosters want to put the games on, oh. and so maybe you could do play-by-play. -play. So I did five games one year, five games another year, and then forgot about that. But when my wife got hired by Roosevelt County Chamber of Commerce uh -huh. as Dallin Sanders' assistant, right. she would go out and meet business people. She talked to Mark and Sandy Bergman, who on the radio station, and kind of jokingly said, oh, yeah, my husband has broadcast experience. So one day out of the blue, I got a call from Sandy Bergman saying she needed somebody to fill in one day to do the coach's show. And I said, well, I've never done anything like this. She said, I'm really desperate. It's a one-time deal. <laughs> that doesn't make you feel good, does it? No. I'll take like, anybody. Yeah, I'm no. desperate. <laughs> well, that was it. So not much was expected. Uh, but after the program, next day I got a call from Sandy saying, would you like to do that program on a permanent basis? And then... After a couple of weeks, she said, would you like to broadcast Greyhound baseball? Well, baseball is my first love. And it's like, yeah, oh. yes. So I broadcast. And so then I became the voice of Eastern Athletics. Right. And um, then Sandy had a morning show mm -hmm. team. And one of the two people left. And she tried a couple of replacements. It wasn't working out. And she said, would you fill in for two weeks? And, and I said, well, I've never done anything. She goes, just two weeks. And Evelyn, that was uh, May of 1999. <laughs> and here we are. And well, that, I am. That was probably the throwdown show with, uh, was it with Kevin Robbins at that Actually, point? Actually, it was, it was 107.5. Mm -hmm. And there was a girl who was a broadcast journalism major here at Eastern, a girl by the name of Natalie James. And so she was one half of the. 107.5 morning mm -hmm. show. And so we became the morning show with uh, Natalie and Doc. Okay. And then a girl named Lauren Bjornson, who went by the stage name of Dana Taylor, uh, she replaced Natalie when Natalie graduated. And then we became the morning show with Doc and Dana. 
Well, my family grew up, I mean, literally my kids grew, they were born in 91 and 95. That was what was on of a morning, was listening to you guys and the trivia portion that you used to do and you could win once a month. And so, you know, my kids were like, had the phone ready to hit the last number. And, and, and that was actually a, a different job because Mark and Sandy sold the stations mm -hmm. to Steve Rooney and Duffy Moon. Right. And when they came, they wanted the 107 show. And so they just kept me on just to do sports. So I was sitting in the studio for three hours and I was doing sports for like four minutes, an hour, and just sitting in the lobby. And Kevin Robbins had gotten the 105.9 show. And so he said one day, hey, Doc, you're just sitting around. Why don't you come in? And I want to do a bit. And so I was kind of his, his Ed McMahon, his Johnny oh, Carson, if people remember that. And uh, then Kevin just said, let's, oh. let's do the show. And the rest says, time flies, Doc. We're out. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today and, and being here. Yeah, well, it's it. been a pleasure. Oh, and to all of you out there, thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time on You Should Know. Cheers.